Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to another podcast of Clara in Conversation with me, Claire Ford. Today on the podcast, I am chatting with Jonah Mabley. John is often referred to as a design guru, having worked on several TV programmes, offering practical, affordable and functional advice on how to improve viewers' homes. John has also designed sets for many high-profile TV shows, having begun his career working on retail and leisure design. He is one of the most striking and well-known faces on television, rocking a gorgeous shaved head, and he also looks fantastic in a kilt. Once spotted as one of the top 10 most eligible bachelors in Scotland, he recently married his long-term partner. Hello, John, and welcome to Claren Conversation. Hello. <laughs> it's lovely to see thank you thank you for that lovely description <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for agreeing to do this this afternoon and I hope everyone at home enjoys it as much as we do as a great lover of languages John I was drawn to the name Amabile which I see from my Italian English dictionary means adjective lovely lovable or amiable You certainly give the impression of being lovely when we see you on television, but is there a dark side to John Amabley? Oh, there's a dark side, a very dark side, yes. No, just like everybody else, I try and be happy. I mean, I'm very, very lucky. I love my job. My hobby at school, which was art, kind of developed into an artistic job, which developed into what I'm doing now. So... Yes, I'm very, very lucky that my hobby became my job, which does keep me happy. But just like everybody, not every day is a super day and sometimes things aren't just as easy. And I'm sure if anybody has watched or listened to me doing 60-minute makeover, you might have heard me almost say a few sweary words just when the whistle's about to blow, when I'm up against it time-wise. But it's like every job, you know, you have to take the rough with the smooth. Nothing always goes plain sailing. If it does, it's a bonus. But yeah, sometimes, some days are worse than others. But amiable um, is the direct translation of the word amabile. And if you sometimes, if anyone's a wine drinker out there, if you see amabile next to a wine or a food, it means it's sweet. Ain't it the truth? (laughs) Everybody has... They're good days and they're bad days. And many congratulations, by the way, on your recent marriage, John. As we mentioned in the introduction, you married your partner, Stephen Gormley, at the end of 2022, after 19 years together. We are used to seeing you on such shows like 60 Minute Makeover, making quick fire design decisions and invariably getting them spot on. But why did it take you and Stephen so long to finally tie the knot after being such a strong unit for so many years? I wasn't sure if he could afford me. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know, it was something, um, I mean, I'm very comfortable in my own skin and who I am now, but, you know, it's taken me a long time to be like that. And 20 years ago, being gay wasn't just as easy as it is now. So I've always probably thought, is it important to me? If I wasn't gay, would I be the sort of person that would enter into a marriage for the certificate and for the licence anyway, I don't know. But it was more to do with, we had been together for so long. Um, I said, although it's not in a written contract, if you did leave me, I would hunt you down and find you anyway. But it was more to do with the legalities of things and the benefits of, I'm not saying that I don't love my partner, of course I do, but it's much more financially economical to be a unit of two than one when it comes to mortgages moving in together and also it meant it was much easier for when we are no longer here who we wanted to leave our money to in a joint and our house and everything to in a joint process so it was something that we didn't take on lightly yeah we probably should have done it 18 years ago because we realized very quickly that we were made for each other but uh, that's why yeah, I'm not I'm not one for a quick decision unless it's to do with some people's curtains. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want it to end up in curtains for me. <laughs> <laughs> and 
You were married in Hotel Duvan at One Devonshire Gardens in Glasgow, John. Guests yeah. at that hotel, which is often simply referred to as One Devonshire Gardens, have included Whitney Houston, David Bowie, Lionel Richie, Elton John, Britney Spears, Kylie Minogue, Robbie Williams, Simon Kill, and many more of the great and good. Obviously, One Devonshire Gardens ticks all the boxes, but how does a man like you, John, with such exquisite taste, Go about choosing a venue for one of the biggest days in your life. But more importantly, did Stephen have any say in the choice of venue? Stephen, yeah, Steve did have quite a big say in it. And it's very difficult living with an interior designer from his point of view, because I know exactly what I want. And this is Steve's home as well. But I, it's, it's more to do with me keeping him happy with the interior and the venue as well, I suppose. But it was really down to me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say to him, I give him a lot. He, to, to be honest, he lo has always loved Hotel Devan One Devonshire. So it was quite easy. And because it was quite an intimate affair, there was only 16 people there. We used one of the medium-sized rooms. It was called the Whiskey Tasting Room, which got 16 to 18 of us comfortably. Um, because I wanted my mum and dad there and Steve's mum. So it really, it, what we were really looking for was something that had a sort of charm, some of comfortable. And I didn't want to lose myself in a day full of seeing hundreds of people because if it hadn't been 16 to 18 people, it would have been over 200. So, yeah, Steve did have a say in it. We saw a couple of places and it just hit the spot. And One Devonshire Gardens has been one of my favourite places since the 90s because it was developed by Ken McCulloch, who was who also owned Rogano in Glasgow, which is a beautiful 1920s Art Deco-inspired interior, built at the same time as they built the Queen Mary. So it was a beautiful homage to something that was kind of Art Deco. So it's a place I've always loved. It has been bought out by the Hotel Duvan Group but yeah, it, it's like a pri it was like a private dining room in your own big house for the day. And it was this time of year, it was actually a year uh, on the 3rd of December. Um, and it was just like a home from home, but you didn't have to do the washing up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds absolutely lovely. And you were married by a very, very close friend and former colleague, Carol Smiley. And I mm -hmm. believe that Carol was actually the catalyst for the two of you deciding to get married. You've known mm -hmm. Carol for over 40 years, John. How did the two of you first meet? Well, I there was a nightclub in Royal Exchange Square and a very, very top-end cocktail bar called Charlie Parker's and Pizzazz. And Carol was at the time associated with the owner of Pizzazz and she interviewed me when I was a student of interior design and she was sort of managing everything and was a meter and greeter and sort of manager in front of house. So she gave me my job as a cocktail barman in Pizzazz. So there's a famous song out there, I was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar, um, which is quite similar, but Carol did a lot of modeling and although she's beautiful, she's not the tallest of people. And although I'm cute, I'm not the tallest of people. But we looked good together. So we used to do a lot of modelling together. And then when I was working, it's amazing, our lives just kept coming back in and bumping into each other. When I was working at Scottish Television on the show The Wheel of Fortune, Carol was the Wheel of Fortune girl. So I bumped into her again. So we'd gone from working in the bar to doing some modelling. I'd gone away to London. I came back from London. And as I was putting the set into the STV studios, who came down the stairs but the new Wheel of Fortune girl, Carol Smiley. So we got really pally again. And she said, you know, listen, I'm doing this show. It's a fashion show called Get It On. I think you can still see it in the STV um, or listen to it in the STV show um, library. So she was presenting, and she said, you know, you'd be really good for this. So we presented a fashion show for Scottish television. And while she was doing that, she was asked to do a show called, don't know if anyone's heard of it, 
changing rooms. So when she was doing changing rooms, she said, you know, John, you'd be brilliant for this. I'm going to present it. You should be doing the designs. And what happened was I'd actually signed up to be one of the youngest production designers for Taggart. And I'd signed a contract to do two years, so I didn't do it. But she suggested me for changing rooms, not change that change changing rooms, sorry. Suggested me for a show called Better Homes, where I worked with another Carol, Carol Vorderman. So we just kept getting in touch. We've always been friendly. So when she obviously started her new business as a celebrant, she's been trying, she's been trying, trying for about maybe eight years to get us hitched. So it was a no-brainer, but she was delighted. And I must say, for me, it was great because she knows so much about me and she knows what it means to me to have found someone to marry. And she got, gets on great with Steve as well. She was just the perfect fit for the perfect day. Although there was a, a photograph of the three of us. So there was me, Carol in the middle, and Steve on the right-hand side. So I, 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 did, uh, I did a joke and I cut Steve off the right-hand side and I gave her the picture of just the two of us. And I said, that's what you wanted all along, wasn't it? You didn't want just to be the minister. You wanted to be Mrs. Amadoli. <laughs> <laughs> to the answer was no. Because it's very hard. <laughs> and has been for many years. But we've got a great got a great relationship. She's got a great sense of humour. And mm-hmm. I love the fact she loves the job that she does because it's such an emotional day um, for a lot of people, whether it be your wedding day, but she also does funerals as well. Mm -hmm. And she spends so much time with the families, getting to know so much about them. So it makes it a very, very personal experience. So she was the right gal for the right job and she made the day. Absolutely. And it adds that extra bit of personal touch as well, which is is lovely to have someone so close to you doing that for you. It's, It's great. And one of the reasons why my dad decided to become an LGBTQ plus ally and role model in his work was that growing up as a baby boomer, and he was born in the same year as you, John, there was not one person in his year in school who came out. Statistically, Mm -hmm. there had to be scores of boys and girls who had been struggling with their sexuality and feeling desperately alone and in pain. Your contemporary Jimmy Somerville sings about the small town mentality in Scotland that drove him away. So what were your experiences like growing up as a young gay man in the late 70s and early 80s in Scotland? Awful. (laughs) Um, School for me was not a pleasant experience. Um, And that starting from primary school in the 69, 1969, 1970, where I was just a very, very quiet, very timid wee boy who wasn't really understood in a very, very masculine field. Um, You know, my dad played football. He's took a long time for him to come to terms with me. Um, But I was just a wee boy. I wouldn't say I was in any way flamboyant or anything, certainly not as much as I went on to be doing the TV shows. But I was just a wee quiet boy who was clearly just quite quiet and sensitive, but it wasn't the easiest. In a way, I suppose I was a wee bit luckier than most because going into an artistic background where I was quite arty um, and also I did a lot of singing. I sang in Paisley Abbey Choir. I was a boy soprano. So a lot of the avenues, and even going into fashion and interior design, so it wasn't like a very male-dominated environment. So for me, I was a, probably a little bit of a little bit protected. But no, it wasn't easy. I think it's. I'm not. I don't think it's easy for anybody, even in today's society, for anybody. But. In the 70s and 80s, it was particularly difficult because it was just just frowned upon, not understood. Um, and then when I did eventually come out, I, mean, I didn't come out to my parents till I was in my 20s. I, already, I had already moved to London. But the minute I came out and moved to London in the late 80s, after studying interior design for four years in Glasgow, that's when the AIDS um, epidemic started so I was just coming out to see on TV 
these big AIDS adverts, which was basically, and everyone was calling it the gay plague. So I may have popped out of the closet, but I jumped back in very, very quickly, uh, obviously with my own friends and close family. But it's a very, very worrying time on top of everybody coming out um, to be then seen to have this or be the proponent of someone who could spread this disease. It was a very, very difficult time, um, a very difficult time for everybody. I, I must say now it is a lot easier. And a lot of my friends, when I, I went to school, that you had to do, you had to play football and you had to play rugby. It was very sports oriented, oriented and um, I just wasn't sporty. The only position I was comfortable playing in sport was the mascot. So it's very difficult. It wasn't easy. Um, and it's great nowadays that there's such a a support network for anybody. And don't, uh, my advice would be is, yes, trust who, trust and be careful who you tell, but get that support because it's there for you. And people are only there to make sure you can have the best life you can have. Absolutely, absolutely. I learned so much through being in the Scottish Youth Parliament about LGBTQ plus rights and equality. We did a lot of things in the Scottish Youth Parliament to raise awareness of that. Um, There's so many role models out there now as well. So like with me in the 60s and 70s, gay people were like John Inman of Are You Being Served or Dan LaRue, who was one of the first female impersonators. So you were either one thing or the other. You know, you were either masculine or you were this over the top flamboyant mm-hmm. gay person. There was not there wasn't any happy medium now, but when you look at things now, it's amazing, you know, like RuPaul's drag race at that end of the scale. It's mm-hmm. actually you know, gay marriage for men and women and same sex marriages. It's just been it's a, it's amazing. It's a much more accepted part and we're all just part of one big world and society now we know there's some countries that are still struggling mm. with accept I mean I go to India a lot and I've seen a lot of changes in the last 15 years from we started going there but there are some areas where you know that it's not understood so we're not there to ram a rainbow flag down anyone's throats it's just live and let live and support where you can who you can but we've had a lot of especially when we're checking into hotels you know we could be lying by the pool and maybe a waiter will come over and say i can't really tell anybody about this but i'm actually gay um what advice could you give um and it's nice that they actually see me as someone they can they can talk to even if they've never seen me on tv it's nice that maybe they see steve and i as a couple and they think oh my goodness you know uh, what a nice couple of guys! It's not we're, we're not we're not here just to do cabaret. That's what I think I'm going to say mm-hmm. about yeah. it. Absolutely, see the person and love is love, definitely. And one of the things I love about watching you walk through a house, John, is your <laughs> passion for the subject of design and your attention to detail. Being blind, I really appreciate how you describe the simplest little touches that can go into making the interiors of our houses so aesthetically pleasing. Glasgow in the late 70s and early 80s was often portrayed as a wasteland full of crumbling tenement buildings with garish over-the-top decor. Paisley and Greenock weren't much better. So where did this taste and passion that you have for the subject of interior design first spring from? It first came from, actually, it was a negative to a positive, really, because when I was a wee boy, I always loved fashion and getting dressed up for occasions. But I was also really intrigued by the surroundings of places. Like, my mum was also very much into her home. And I think a lot of, you know, my mum and dad are now 83. They grew up with not very much. My mum's from Ayrshire, my dad's from the Gorbals. So they grew up with not very much. And it wasn't about being ostentatious. It was about being comfortable at home with my mum. So even when I was a wee boy and I grew up, the first house was, well, it was in the south side of Glasgow. And then we moved to Cardonald. I could come home from school and my mum wouldn't just have changed the room around. 
her bedroom would then have been our bedroom, or my, <laughs> they'd have moved, she'd have moved functions around like our bedroom. We come home. I've just made that the dining room, or like. We've taken the two bunk beds down, John. Now you've got two single beds for you and your brother, Mark. So we're giving you the big bedroom and your dad and I are going to the other bedroom. So she was, she, she's always had an eye for changing things around. But I originally wanted to be a fashion designer. I want to be an actor or a fashion designer. And I kind of chickened out of going down the drama route at the time because I was quite self-conscious and it might have been the gay thing as well and, Again, with a flamboyant, I don't know. I didn't know if it was right for me, the acting thing. But I wanted to be a fashion designer, and I didn't get in. But as a backup, I'd applied for an interior design course. Because in the 80s, interior design was really something for very rich and wealthy people or the royal family had, or you were doing up a palace. It was certainly nothing you used to design your own home. You basically went to a department store and said, I'll take those curtains and take that carpet. And more often than not, you did what your mum and dad had. But as things evolved, and I was in the right place at the right time, where people started spending more money and the high street was king when you were out shopping, it was all about you went to a fashionable shop, which led itself into fashionable homes. So my passion for changing things around and wanting nice things around me kind of grew in with my artistic background to start thinking about, well, how do I, how do I want to live? Who am I? How do I say what's me about my home? How do I make the best of what I've got? And I must say, the natural progression with a wee introduction of Carol Smiley getting me into the changing rooms, into the change that, which was a day, which was a daytime show, very much like uh, the recycling shop that's on just now, or the renovation shows, led me to a show which showed you how you could change your home. So it was a kind of bizarre route of loving what I do, loving my own interior. And as a wee boy, I was always changing my bedroom around or turning it, my brother and I's bunk beds into a wee caravan to make a story about us going away for the weekend. Huge imagination. And that's where my passion for interiors grew. And being incredibly nosy has really driven me on. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being a bit inquisitive I'm exactly the same as well so me and you both share that and from school in Paisley John you went on to study interior design in Glasgow and got your degree there and in the yep. blink of an eye you were out in the Middle East designing the interiors for private jet aeroplanes and luxury mm. cruise liners even rubbing shoulders with the mega reach of the United Arab Emirates and also designing part of the lounge for Abu Dhabi International Airport. So how did this stratospheric rise from the Gordos to the Middle East come about? Do you know, again, it's about being... I don't know. I'm a great believer of, of serendipity and what's for you won't go by. It. And I'm not saying I was in the right... I've always been in the right place at the right time, but I've always been able to look about and see what I wanted to do. I mean, I can remember thinking when the fashion shows came out, like the clothes show and stuff, and I thought, I wish there was a show about interior design. And before you knew it, a couple of years later, I was doing it. So, but when it came round to talking about things at the Abu Dhabi International Airport and designing jewellery shops out in Dubai, the company I worked for um, in London were a shop fitting company. So they wanted to work with somebody when they were looking for designers who had a good background in technical drawing and interior design. And luckily, my course did have that. And I was also, I did technical drawing uh, when I was at school as well, in first and second year, and then woodwork and metalwork. So I ha not only did I have the sort of mind where I could know how things would look, I had a good understanding of how things could be made. So the company that I was working for designed duty-free shops. So that's how I got into designing the duty-free shop and the lounges in Abu Dhabi Airport. I also designed in Cyprus um, the very first Woolworths. And the Woolworths in Cyprus was a bit more like Harrods than the Woolworths we knew. Um, and that was a very prestigious, a huge, grand department store in Limassol. So it was really just a case of 
that job took me there and it got me through another door and the people that owned the department store also owned the jewellery shop of the Grosvenor Hotel in London so I got that to do so I basically kind of fell into it and it's just been the right I'm not saying I haven't worked hard because I have but I've always had my eye on what's next I'm kind of the rolling stone that gathered no moss and even in, when I'm going to be 60 next year, same as your daddy, um, I've just always thought, what's next? I've always had that, what's my next exciting project? I've never rested on my laurels. So from the Gorbals, where I studied, uh, Florence Street, which has now been turned into a beautiful block of flats. Um, and it, the funny thing is, Florence Street, I've been doing a lot about my history and heritage. It turns out that my great gran gave birth to my grandpa's younger sister ten blocks up from where I went to college in Florence Street in the Gorbals. It's bonkers. So maybe there's something about the Gorbals that has given me the Gorbals die hard attitude to move on like all the Amabilies have. Um but yeah I I've been I've been lucky. I've worked for it, but it's taken me all around the world, and I love it. That must have been a dream come true for you, and an incredible experience. And taking you back to your childhood, John, you actually had a very difficult start to life, and your parents thought that you, they were going to lose you. Can you tell us a bit about that and how having such a close brush with death so early in your life has helped shape you as a person? Well, it's one of those things, I mean, obviously, because I, I was a baby, so I can't remember anything of it. But basically, I was due to be born on July the 24th, and I was born on June the 9th. So I was almost two months early. And in those days, in 1964, you know, it wasn't the the child care and pediatric care that you have now. So basically, my mum went into labour very early and the pressure of the birth and me being early um caused me to be born without this the skin over my my tummy burst because it wasn't formed so that's a condition called exomphalus now exomphalus is actually and also if i'd gone full term i would probably been born with my bowels outside my body. And nowadays you can poke them back through your belly button. But basically I looked like a a steak pie with a crust off. I was just a huge big, from underneath my rib cage to where your belly was, I was just an open wound. So basically the pressure of the birth, they you wrap me in tin foil, was only four pounds and four. And they took me away from the Rotten Row Hospital, which is at Strathclyde University. The front of the building's still there, but it's the campus now. But that was called the Rotten Row Maternity. And I was taken away to the Sick Children's Hospital. And by the time my dad got to that hospital, the surgeon said, Mr. Amabile, quite honestly, your, your son's been born with his guts outside his body, and we don't think he's going to last the night. Meanwhile... My mum was screaming the place down because they didn't even tell her if I was a wee boy or a wee girl. And I sometimes joke, <laughs> say, you're still wondering. <laughs> but I was in an incubator for three months. So basically, what they to do was, imagine you've got a jumper with a hole in it and you have to stitch that hole together. So they stitched that hole together. So where I would have a belly button, which I don't, I've got what looks a bit like a Chesterfield couch. And if you feel that, it's got buttons into it. Very, I've got a deep buttoned, deep upholstered belly button area. And basically, that's what I was born with. So I was in the incubator for three months. I finally got out and I was very small for many. And even in primary one and two, I was always the smallest boy at school. It took a while for me to develop. But what I, I do a lot of work for premature babies and I do a lot of ladies' lunches where I host the event. And I always say to the ladies and daddies that are there, if you're worried your wee one pound or two pound bag of sugar is not going to grow, don't worry. Yeah. I'm morbid obese now and I can't get enough pies. Yeah. 
<laughs> I built my. So that's when we built the city on sausage rolls. <laughs> I eventually found my appetite, and I didn't mm-hmm. stop. So, so it was a obviously a close brush with death. I don't know what if it's because obviously it was as a baby, if it's made me determined to fight what I've got and get up and keep going and pushing myself. I don't know if there's an inbuilt thing because I really did have to fight for my life for the, for those three months to then mm-hmm. get to I could get out of the hospital with a something intrinsically built into me that makes me a fighter. I don't know, but um, it's probably more problematic and life changing for my mum and dad than it was for me because I was too young to remember. But um, yeah, I think it's shaped me as a person. There must be something in there that makes me think, get what you want, Johnny boy. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it's fantastic that you have that attitude. And for parents of children with exomphilus, you must be a shining role model to them. And another thing that you are well known and love for, John, is your work with various charities over the years, participating in kilt walks and also raising vital funds for Callum's Cabin, which is a charity that provides holiday homes for children and young people living with cancer and their families. And you are also an ambassador for a charity that is very close to myself and my family's heart, Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus Scotland as my primary medical condition, which led to my sight loss, is hydrocephalus. This ability to reach out to children's charities, how much of that do you owe to your own childhood experiences with Exomphilus? I think because I know the care and attention that I had and saved my life and kept me alive and have given me this wonderful life, I just think these people need to be supported and, and heralded and for themselves as well as I mean, these things don't call co- these things cost the earth the support. Um and I just think there's so many unsung heroes. I actually did on one of the evenings um for Scottish Spina Bifida, I tried to find I've always tried to find the surgeon who saved my life. And I I found there was a table from the York Hill Hospital and I found the person who was head of the surgery for children and I asked him about my doctor and you know it it died six weeks before that event and I was so sorry that I hadn't spent more time to say to find him to be able to say first of all thank you and to raise awareness for what he and his predecessors all do um I don't know I've always been drawn to think I think because I had quite a difficult childhood from the illness as well as growing up being a wee gay boy and being bullied I've always thought that it's fundamental it's a bit like a building you need foundations or a bit like planting you need a good strong seed for that to grow or to build on so if I I've always thought if I can do anything to help support children with spina bifida if they need the holiday homes, if they're living with cancer. It's always just resonated with me that, that that's the kind of work. If I can raise awareness and raise money, I mean, the amount of... I think that when I stopped doing the ladies' lunches, we'd, we'd made something like £3 million over, over the last, like... I mean, it was like 25, 30 years I've been doing the ladies' lunches and charities. Um, yeah, I just think I'm drawn to... To charities that help children because that's where you, that, I think that's the time where you need it the most. Absolutely, and it's fantastic that you do that work, and you've obviously got that empathy with not just the children who are going through things, but the parents as well. Also, John, as I mentioned in the introduction, you wear the kilt with a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> but I'm sure I read somewhere that when choosing to don the kilt for the first time, you weren't consciously intending to set a new fashion trend. And in fact, your reason for doing it was far more prosaic. Can you tell us why you first decided to wear the kilt on our television screens? Well... I kind of thought I needed something that was going to... People say, you've got to get a gimmick. And I didn't really want to, because I wanted to be taken seriously, because I'm a serious designer, and I know I do quick makeover shows. But, you know, 
you know, I'm a qualified interior designer and I'm really there to prescribe the best interior for your home. But I was working with Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. <laughs> and anyone who has seen or heard of him knows that he's very flamboyant. Mm-hmm. And he wore like fluffy cuffs and he was like a, a cavalier. And I thought, what can I do? And I've always had quite a good pair of legs for a kilt as well. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. And also, I thought it might give it might take the look away from my huge big bahookie, which, if anyone's not Scottish, this means your rear end. <laughs> so there was a few reasons, but it was to get a gimmick, and it actually it turned it turned out to be good for that for getting me noticed, but not very practical when you're doing running about and going up ladders. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a fantastic gimmick to have and it's good to obviously show your passion for Scotland as well with yeah. with the kilt. And as a bald man, John, my dad often makes the observation, God only made few perfect heads, the rest they covered with hair. I'm not sure about my dad, John, but you've got the perfect head for shaving. <laughs> as a former model who is often credited with introducing Charlie Nicholas to the mullet, how difficult was it for you to come to terms with the receding hairline? Did you embrace it, or were you like Homer Simpson and my dad and grieved over it? I was devastated to begin with. I loved my hair. I spent so much time doing my hair. My dad often says that's why I went baldy, <laughs> because I was always dying it, blow drying it. I had Two hair dryers, one for every day, one in case one packed in. I had a hot tongue to keep the back of the mullet curled under at the back or a wee ringlet at the side. I used to have a big blonde streak down the front of it. I was always, always doing my hair. So when I first started noticing it going, I was devastated. And the first time I did notice, my friend had to, had a baby and there was a picture of me at the christening day and I'm looking down at the baby but it was in my arms, and I saw this wee white patch at the top of the back of my head, and I put my hand on it to feel it, and I thought, oh, lordy, I'm going baldy. <laughs> so that's when it started, and the bit at the back, I don't know how your dad's progressed, but the bit at the back with mine then joined my widow's peaks, which is either side of your forehead. These all joined, and I was left with a wee tufty bit, and I hung on to it as long as I could. Short of being a petty comb over, and I just thought, when it went, I thought, you know, it's gone. That's it. When it was gone, I don't lament it. And here's another wee tip for your dad. Now, Yul Brynner, one of the most famous baldies next to Kojak, went bald, and he he went he shaved his head in his thirties. But see if you look at Real Brenner when he's in The King and I when he was age thirty to when he was age seventy, he looked the same. So my thing is, your dad and I are forever young because we don't have hair to date us. So as long as you keep your your eyebrows in trim, we're flawless. We're babies forever. Absolutely. Just embrace it. That's what I always say as well. And it's very obvious from your social media posts, John, that you enjoy exploring Scotland. We've seen pictures from Sky, Tyree, Oban, Barra, Gia, and all over Bonnie, Scotland. When you were younger, you and your brother flummoxed your parents by preferring to go to Aberdeen rather than travelling abroad for the summer holidays. You and Stephen have your happy place in Goa and you've travelled all around the world. But what is it about Scotland that has such a strong appeal for you? Do you know what? I've just got such an affinity with Scotland and I just think when you've got the weather, you can be in the Bahamas, but you're up in Tyree. The beaches are beautiful. Mm. It's just, you know, it's all it, it, it's just bliss on your doorstep. I've also been up there when it's piddling down in a tent, thinking, "What in God's earth am I doing sitting up here?" Because we do a bit of glamp camping, but I call it glamping, and I've got my sheepskin rugs, and I like to do. I don't know. I just think Scotland has just got everything. I just absolutely love it, and although. My surname is Amabile. My mum, oh, that's another story. We've just found out my mum at 83, where her maiden name was Brown. She's not a Brown. 
Mm-hmm. She's actually a Valentini because my gran had an affair with another Italian man. So I'm much more Italian than I thought. But I absolutely love Scotland. And, you know, we just get in the car. I live in Mulgai in the outskirts of Glasgow. Within 20, 30 minutes, I can be in Loch Lomond. Mm-hmm. And it's just a hop, skip and a jump to paradise for me. I just absolutely love it. I love it as well. I love going for drives, especially long drives in the car. Even though I can't see things clearly now, just sitting, looking out the window and just going for nice long drives, it's it's the best thing ever. Especially where I live down in Greenock, you've got the water and the coastline. You can't beat it. And you're a very high energy kind of guy, John, with lots of projects on the go. But most people will probably know you best for your television presenting work, as well as Get It On, we've seen you on interior design programmes, Change That, 60 Minute Makeover and Better Homes, as well as presenting segments for GMTV, This Morning, The Hour and many other popular television programmes past and present. You seem to be very comfortable in front of the cameras, John, but how smoothly or otherwise was the transition from being behind the scenes to being in front of the cameras? Not smooth at all. <laughs> um, you, you think it's going to be very easy and you know I take my hats off to presenters especially people who have to it's a lot easier now if they've got the auto cue and see if you kind of you get a lot you know um, talk back into your ear but when you've got a lot of dialogue to remember um, it wasn't easy at all and I thought I was going to because I'm, a, I'm no stranger to gabbing and I love chatting I thought it would be an easy transition but a very very first interview was with the Scottish supermodel Christy Hume and she's originally from Presswick and I was in Milan to interview other supermodels like Naomi Campbell, Shalom, other big big Trish Goff, big big modelling names and I was meeting Christy Hume and I thought it'd be funny if I took her a wee can of iron brew over she must have been missing Scotland and I was so uptight and nervous all I said to her was um do you, do you like being a model because I've got a wee can, got a wee can of iron brew that was it that's all I could say I couldn't because yeah, all of a sudden when you think what you when you've got to think about what you have to say it doesn't trip off the tongue. So it took me a long time to realise that the camera was my friend and I was just, I just always think I'm talking like I'm talking to you now when mm-hmm. I'm doing any presenting um, or when I was in the studio doing the air with Michelle Manis where we had a lot of scripts to look through. Mm-hmm. Just take a breath, be comfortable, make sure you kind of understand and you can ad lib if you get stuck with the words. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, it wasn't easy. And my first, my first attempts, my first line was, hello and welcome to Milan. I'm John Amabile and I'm here to interview the supermodels. It took me 25 takes. <laughs> People were losing the world to listen. <laughs> <laughs> And I lost the bulk of my sight, as I mentioned earlier on, nine years ago, John. But I recall watching you on television coming up time after time with fresh, exciting and innovative ways to transform people's homes. Each show provided viewers with very different ideas. You've been in the the field of interior design almost 40 years now, John, and you seem to have an inexhaustible well of wonderful design ideas. Where do you get your inspiration? You know, it's a, that's a great question because people always ask me, A, what's your inspiration and what's my style? Now, my style is anything you want it to be because I'm there. If I was coming to design a room for you, I would interview you and find out what you like, how to live. It'd be very easy for me just to jump around and do what I like in everyone's homes, but that's not the challenge. That's not the best thing about being an interior designer. So I listen, and I think that's why my designs worked so well on 60 Minute Makeover, because I listened to what people wanted. And I would take an idea and run with it, but move it on further. When it comes to the main inspiration, where do I get my ideas from? Interior design is a bit like the fashion industry. New collections are brought out by designers once, twice, three times a year. 
So I'm always seeing new things, new collections, new colours, new textures. And as well as it being about what we see, it's a bit like you saying you love driving in the Highlands. So you're taking on other senses. You're taking in that fresh air, the, uh, fresh air. You're taking in that breeze. You're taking in maybe the smell of freshly cut grass. I look at all the senses. I'm thinking about the sense of walking on a soft floor or a hard floor. I'm thinking about putting a sheepskin rug over the back of a sofa so that it feels very comfortable and supports your back and keeps you cosy. So design's just not all about keeping up with the Joneses and being bling bling. It's about getting it right in the atmosphere and how you want to live. So my inspiration comes from people like you and anybody that watches the show and what's out there. I'm just, again, very, very nosy. <laughs> Fantastic. And although I recall reading that, although you enjoyed working on 60 Minute Makeover, you actually preferred the format of Better Homes, as the less hectic pace of that programme afforded you more time to work on projects that were perfectly suited to the people in the homes that you were working on at the time. Looking back on it, do you think that being given more time to work on projects created better results? Or is there something to be said about thinking on your feet and trusting your instincts? I think it's a blend of the two, and they're two very different beasts. Where I had one room and a week to work on it on Better Homes, where you could maybe do more building work, build an extension, turn a bedroom into a kitchen, blah, blah, blah. Whereas the... The 60-minute makeover, I think, was more we were up against it time-wise. 60-minute makeover is great for ideas and quick fixes, but the finish wasn't always the way I'd like to have left it. And we couldn't do anything that would take longer than 60 minutes, so we couldn't tile. We couldn't really paint anything that was a water, wasn't a water-based paint. So we very rarely did any glossing on the doors or anything. We very rarely did kitchens and bathrooms because you need four or five different trades. So I'd say it's a blend... I loved 60 Minute Makeover because it got the ideas out to people. And I'm always a great believer. It doesn't matter if you've got 50 pence or £50,000. Design is for everybody. A wee cushion or a wee throw can change something, can change the way something feels, can change the way something smells, can change the way something looks. So it's about design is for everybody. So 60 Minute Makeover got all those design eyes out there. Better Homes got the idea of how you could do it properly by working with builders and joiners and technicians. But it was a happy blend of ideas. But good tradesmen, or if you're a good handyman or you're into it yourself, of taking time to create a good job. Absolutely. And in recent years, John, you have become a regular fixture at the Ideal Home Show at the SCCC in Glasgow. And I am always very struck in how passionate and enthusiastic you are in encouraging people to be bold and adventurous in the design ideas that they have for their homes. How important is it, do you think, to help us to relax and unwind and for our own mental health to have living spaces that perfectly reflect our own unique tastes and personalities? I think it's hugely important. I mean, where do you spend most of your life at home? And we've gone from functional kitchens turned into beautiful, almost industrial kitchens where you could be as good as Gordon Ramsay or your bathroom is almost like your own spa or chill zone. And I think we do spend so much more, and it's not about showing everybody who you are, it's about how you go back and go into your little cocoon or into your little nest and feel supported, where you can think about how the day went and how you un unwind and relax. I think more than more often than not, most people, even people that, have had kitchens and dining rooms and living rooms, they're making them big open plan things like the big American diner with the big, and they call it the den. You know, it's about how you live and how you relax and how you really enjoy your home space. Absolutely. And over the years, John, one of the things that you've been encouraging us to do at the Ideal Home Show is upcycle and repurpose old items through the use of the Upcycle Academy on radio and giving online tutorials. 
I was particularly taken with the ideas for shelving, which was taken from the cult horror film Rosemary's Baby, less so with the ideas of turning your old curtains into a thong. <laughs> uh, how important is it for us to repurpose and recycle old items to help protect the environment and to keep costs down? Oh, I think it's hugely important. I mean, apart from filling landfill sites with very quick DIY stores, flat pack business, which are great for just starting. If you have seen something like was I had a, a, a coffee table that my mum and dad got when they got married and I stripped it all back. It was a sort of teak finish, which was very popular in the 60s. It's a very rich redwood. It's, it is a species that you shouldn't be chopping down now as well in the equatorial rainforest. So I had that for years. And, you know, I stripped it, I painted it, I tiled on top of it, I took it off and re-stripped it again. So that saved me buying maybe six coffee tables. So that saved a little bit of the environment. But also every time I look at it, I just loved it because I remembered it as a wee boy sitting having my tea watching the Pink Panther with my brother okay. with, your, with your wee chairs and stuff. And then I remembered it in my first flat in London. I remember, you know, I just, I just think reusing things as as well as being important for the environment, it's just so rewarding. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And famous interior designers Linda Barker, Anna Ryder Richardson, and Scotland's very own Colin and Justin have all taken part in I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here over the years. Could you ever see yourself sleeping out in the open in the Australian outback and feasting on the private parts of some exotic animals? Um, I'll take that in two parts. Would I camp in the Australian outback? Yes. Would I feast on the private parts of exotic animals? No. <laughs> I do love my food and I love a big portion, but I can't see me. I mean, one of the worst things, and I can't, it actually makes me sick to think about it, is that fermented egg. And oh. eat egg well. that's been. And there's and that even thinking about that can make me sick. I actually was up for it one year, a, the year yeah. two years. Justin and Colin were in, and they had the interviews. And I think at the time they were they were trying to do the, the. It's always about dynamics of people, and I think they were looking for a flamboyant designer who was quite bitchy and a little bit over the top, <laughs> which I can be. But I didn't want to go into the jungle being a character. It's me or not, and I'm not a big flamboyant, girly, bitchy, queeny person. I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to have to play the part, so I didn't get it that year. And then they'd never ask me again. Would I do it if they asked me? Yes, I would, but I'm not eating anyone's genitals. I, I just, I, I couldn't, um, I'm a massive fan of the show and I watch it every year, even though I don't have my sight now, still react the exact same way that I did when I had sight. So, you know, no, just not for me at all. And for more than 20 years now, John, you have been running your own interior design company, John Amabley Design, which offers tailor-made design solutions to private homes and businesses all around the UK and all over the world. You have your very own room in a box online design service and your very own range of home design furnishings. As we mentioned earlier on, you and Stephen have recently got married and you spend quite a bit of time at your beautiful holiday home in Goa. You seem to be in a pretty good place, but what does the future hold for John Amabley? Um, probably just more of the same. I mean, I love my job. I love the team at John Amabley Design, Claudia Capaldi and Hannah Gibson. They're two great designers that work with me. They help me create all the things that you can buy online at johnamabledesign.com in the Essentials range. And they are so affordable. And things like Room in the Box, where we've created a design, say, listen, you don't have to pay us to design this. We've created a design for you and you can buy it. So you're literally buying your room in the box. So I'm quite happy doing all of that. I think as years go on and being 60 next year, I'll, next year, I will always be rubbish with nothing to do, but I might not want to do as much. So I'm possibly design-wise handing the mantle over to the gals in the studio who are great. But then I was on site this morning at half past eight. I'm about to do a skin care clinic. And I just absolutely love the buzz of being back on site again. So I think more of the same, maybe not as much of it, but I ain't going nowhere. That's fantastic and great to hear it because 
you're such a, a big presence. Um, and John, you've certainly lived up to your surname today. And it's been a pleasure having you as my guest on Clara in Conversation. Thank you very much. I've absolutely loved it. Thank you. Thank you. And John can be seen every year at the Ideal Home Show, giving advice on all things interior design um, at the SCCC in Glasgow. And if you want to speak to John directly about all things interior design, as, as he just mentioned there, his website, John Amabley Design, is free online. And the details are on, on the website if you want to, to go and have a look. John, it's an absolute pleasure. Again, thank you so much. Pleasure.